like the A to Z on menstrual health and uh, beyond the bleed. Hello, Fiona Catchpole. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. You are the founder of Talking Periods. And, uh, and I put, put it out there when I shared that we were doing this live, uh, that women, we don't talk enough about periods. One of my connections said she does all the time, but I, I don't know that, I don't know that we do, to be honest. I don't know that we do in the way that helps us with the bigger picture. That's maybe what you mean. Yes. Yeah, you, I believe there's been a lot of great work with people talking about periods um, more readily, especially with the younger cohort. Um, obviously, we, we're talking a lot more about perimenopause and menopause, um, but it's the menstrual health. So it's the bit beyond the bleed. I think a lot has been talked about recently about the mechanics and um, of the actual bleeding process and what equipment we can use and how to access it and the great work being done in Scotland, of course, with mm, period poverty great. and products being a bit available for free. Um, there's been a lot done on the terminology. Are they uh, feminine hygiene products or are they period products? Oh. So they're period products. So if you talk about men uh, feminine hygiene products, it suggests that it's not you know it's not hygienic, hygienic. Yeah. so we dropped that word and it was only two years ago that the global coalition decided on a, a definition of menstrual health which is to talk about it as as a whole thing uh, mental health the physical aspects of the whole menstrual cycle from start to finish mm -hmm. and therefore um it's about from the day we start our periods to the day we stop and beyond. And it's, mm -hmm. it's what is happening every day in our bodies due to our menstrual cycle and our ovarian activity. And for me, like with you, we dive deep into this situation and we sit there and we go, I thought I was a clever person. How come, <laughs> how come I don't know about this? And you feel a little bit, I felt a little bit silly for quite some time going, I'm a biology teacher. You know, in a past life, I've been a biology teacher. I'll go, how did I miss the menopause memo? But what I really missed was the menstrual health memo, you know. And yeah. I've rummaged around and tried to figure out why we don't talk about it. And obviously, there's cultural, religion, um, the patriarchy of, you know, the society that we're in. But it is also because we just don't talk about it so we don't learn how to talk about it we we don't have a menstrual health literacy the same way we don't have a menopause literacy we just don't know the words to describe it mm -hmm. and uh, I'm reading Atlas of the Heart by Brenny Brown at the moment as well and she talks about you know if we don't have the words to communicate our emotions to ourselves how are we possibly going to explain these things to other people mm -hmm. so I think we've managed to get ourselves into a bit of a situation just by not wanting to show our vulnerabilities as well, not wanting to show our weak points. Um, even today now in schools, uh, I think still today, um, two years ago anyway, there was a big article in the Telegraph where a, a head of sixth form had emailed girls at school saying they weren't allowed to have time off for period pains because it was just part of being a woman and they had to get used to it. Okay. So if our young women are still being told that rhetoric now, whereas if you are in pain and it's debilitating and it's a period pain, that is not okay. You know, you then you need to talk about it. You need to find out what is causing this pain. It, there is some pain involved, but if it's debilitating or, it, you know, it depends on everybody's own threshold. If mm -hmm. it hurts, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And, we need to be talking about, okay, what could we be doing, not just those seven days, but the other 21 to help mm -hmm. support our cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I got to this end of the perimenopause discussion because of that. I was thinking, why don't we talk about menopause, which then took me to, well, why don't we talk about menstruation? And so I'm kind of trying to fix that part of the timeline because I think that would then, as younger women move along that hormone highway, they'll have more knowledge, be more um, aware and be able to hopefully um, tackle the changes with 
more, you know, style, class, <laughs> aplomb. <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. they yeah. want we're, to we're have it. We're styling know? it out, aren't we? Yeah. Well, yeah. Rather than crashing through it like I have with like a, you know, like a little Bambi on ice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think it was very much in the media the last couple of weeks with, uh, was it Jess? Is that her name, Jess Innes, the athlete? Well, there was Dina Asher-Smith. Oh, that one. I was yeah, there was Ailish that. McColgan and oh, Jessica Ennis as well. That's it, Jessica Ennis. I know yeah. she's doing some good work, but it was specifically around this um, performance issue that uh, Dina Asher Smith was having. Yeah, she called it girl stuff. She, oh, you know, girl she was stuff. being interviewed on BBC. She mm -hmm. said, uh, yeah, it was a bit of girl stuff that had affected her performance. And, um, you know, so the world of sport are, are starting to take some heed. Um, who is it? The Well HQ are doing really good work on that um, and helping keep girls in sport for longer as well, because a lot of it can be to do with periods and how we deal with periods. We don't stay in sport yeah. um, because some of those challenges. And then if you do stay in sport, you've, you've you know, really got to be looking after your menstrual health to help with your, your performance. So it's great that some of the elite athletes are now talking about it. But mm -hmm. you don't have to be an elite athlete, though, to learn about your menstrual health. <laughs> No, you really don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Uh, athletes are presented with challenges that ordinary us ordinary folk, maybe we, we don't encounter. And they're, they're doing that work, uh, raising awareness uh, mm -hmm. for everybody, which is, which is great. But, um, I mean, I, I must tell you, I, I was uh, a, a runner before... Yeah, like from being very young, my family mm. were into athletics. And so mm. before I even started my periods, I was uh, a re regular runner. And mm. then you quite rightly point out that periods come into that equation that, you know, I didn't used to have to think about that. And, and, it, and it is a concern that you, um, there's some days of the month when it's just not, it's not yeah. critical. It's really to, to, to join in with the training or the if, yeah. a race, if a race falls on the wrong day of the month, you know. And, and so it, it, it is interesting that uh, for, for some girls, that's something that sort of sends them away from, from sport and uh, an activity. And that's such a shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then we, as we know, when we hit perimenopause, if the habits that we kind of build in early on, um, if we're, if that's one of our challenges, not moving enough amongst mm -hmm. other things, then, mm -hmm. you know, just imagine if we could make it better for younger women to actually continue with those kinds of things. And then it's about learning to, and if you're not an athlete, it's about kind of learning um how you feel at different points in your cycle so you can look at the things that you may do better at certain times and what you need to so like there's windows of opportunity and windows of vulnerability mm -hmm. and learning when they are and learning about yourself um which I started to do at the point of perimenopause mm -hmm. and I did it by accident it wasn't till much later I realized oh my God, so the tracking I was doing and learning and understanding, um, God, if I had been able to do that 30, for 30 years, <laughs> imagine how much better I may have felt. Um, I found a lot of it linked very much to wanting to stay active or not be active, you know, at different times of my periods. And if, um, if I, at the time of perimenopause, where a lot of women get to where they can experience heavy bleeding, Mm -hmm. you know and it's that bleeding when you're not really quite sure when it's going to happen mm -hmm. um but had I known a little bit more about the things I could have the nutrition I could have been changing my nutrition during the course of the month mm -hmm. I could have been changing the way I move during the course of the month and doing a lot more to support menstrual health as a whole yeah. um I probably would have stayed active more which would have helped my joint aches and pains and all of yeah. those other things you know but there's no like um, obviously we know we know there's no magic cure for it, magic wallet. <laughs> but being more aware, um, I think it helps to reduce anxiety. Apart from anything else, especially mm -hmm. you know when you don't know what's going on and you're making it up as you go along, mm -hmm. you know. So 
So, so what, what sorts of key messages uh, are you keen to communicate to, uh, you know, this population of younger women? It's about accepting this journey first of all acceptance is key understanding that your ovarian activity you have um, a lifespan if you like so if we're talking about a typical hormone journey from periods to no periods it is on average 40 years obviously we know some may be shorter and for some it may be longer but the ovaries are pre-programmed to have approximately 400 to 450 periods in a lifetime. And knowing that even, and then if you do some quick maths and things like that, you know, you can work out, right, okay, so I am going to have 10 menstrual cycles minimum probably in a year. And I need to be aware of when they are. I need to have my menstrual health toolkit ready to go you know what are you know my body is changing mm -hmm. I talk about it like operating system so my key message would be about understanding that it's a 40-year journey to put to before you hit post-menopause but the risks and consequences of how you travel along that hormone highway are going to you know impact you post-menopause and it's about tracking and understanding it's about collecting the data on you and then when you start to understand more about your own menstrual health in your 20s and 30s, every time there's a slight shift or change in operating system, you will feel it and you'll understand it and it won't be quite so much of a shock. Mm. And it's, it's kind of just adjusting to the fact that there is this, you know, just step back and look where you are on your hormone journey now and where you've just been and what you've got to come ahead of you. And the fact that the hormones involved in the menstrual cycle are the same hormones involved in menopausing. It was interesting. I posted something on Facebook the other day about um, uh, what would you say to your younger self mm. about menopause? And somebody commented about, um, oh, well, of course, you don't have to have symptoms when you're at menopause. And I'm like, no, of course you don't. The word menopause doesn't mean perimenopausal symptoms or menopausal symptoms. They're both Two, they're two separate conversations in the same book, but the chapter that comes at the very beginning is menstrual health. And it made me suddenly realize we talk about menstrual health and we talk about periods and we accept signs and symptoms of menstrual health, let's just say. So we accept we might get some PMS. We accept that we might get some cramping. Um, we accept we might get headaches and you know, there's a collection of menstrual health symptoms. We understand the hormone changes in pregnancy and we accept that we might have some signs and symptoms of pregnancy, like morning sickness, or afterwards when those hormones come crashing down, we accept that we could be susceptible to you know, postnatal depression. But when it gets to perimenopause, oh no, we can't possibly accept symptoms. Oh no, no, I'm not doing menopause. How many times have I heard people say that? No, I'm not doing menopause. And you go, right, hang on, please pay attention. <laughs> Let's just go back. <laughs> we know these hormones are changing and you're accepting that there are changes in your body at different times of the month. So as we move along that hormone highway, there are going to be other changes that you have to accept and figure out what you put in your toolkit that you're going to help deal with them in the best way possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're talking about is two areas where there's been historically a lot more education Mm -hmm. uh, you know, around the starting of the periods and having the, the babies and all the all the hormonal consequences of, of, of around those times. And there was a little bit less around menopause. And so maybe it was that um, mysterious nature, the fact that, yeah. you know, uh, we sort of kind of knew this stuff was imminent. We sort of knew this was going to happen, but I was totally ill-prepared uh, you know, for that. Uh, yeah. So I think you know that education around the whole of the men, uh, of the, sorry, the whole of the menstrual uh, lifespan is what you're yeah. talking about. The beginning, the middle, if you want to call it that, and the end um, is is really important for us. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, it's uh, it is interesting what you say because I think that the symptoms that we might experience around. Uh, 
the menstrual cycle when it's its usual thing, whatever it is, around pregnancy and around menopause are a lot more easy to accept some some than others is all I'm going to say. Yeah. You know, and there is a kind of a spectrum of intensity where mild to moderate symptoms, yeah. you, you know, you can kind of tolerate and uh, deal with and, and just sort of roll your eyes. But uh, severe symptoms that, you know, if we, periods, I had a friend and she would have a couple of days a month when she couldn't get out of bed yeah. because of pain and uh, and she would vomit you know and, and yeah. really it was prohibitive uh, her period experience now uh, she was medicated uh, with uh, contraception you know lots mm. of uh, women end up being medicated with contraception as a way of sort of moderating those symptoms mm. Uh, pregnancy if you think of that uh, you know morning sickness versus the extreme, uh, nausea and vomiting that I think Kate um, wins mm. had, didn't she? Oh yes, yes. Remember, and she had the end up in hospital on a drip, mm. you know. And so th there's always a bit of a spectrum. And so we're not suggesting that uh, you know tough it up because some of those symptoms are really yeah. can be quite severe and uh, life uh, debilitating. You know, yeah. the mental health issues that mm. some women face the, uh, the the depression anxiety for me the sleeplessness that I was suffering was really just on a on a mm. whole nother scale of, of dreadful um and uh, uh but you know so mm. so you know kind of yeah. but if you start realize. to collect the data on you as well yeah. you can make some changes and things yeah. and i think the other big thing for me as i was learning more about um menstrual health in general oh is there an echo in the room oh, oh i'm not hearing no, it. Maybe it's me. <laughs> um was the the research on estrogen that came out about twenty years ago that still doesn't is only just hitting the airwaves now, and I I felt like well if you've known how important the molecule this hormone estrogen is uh, throughout our entire lives for males and females, but particularly mm -hmm. in our case the fact that that estrogen or the estradiol is going up and down each month, and then we've got our lifetime changes going up and then down when you know that estrogen is, is a family is a collective name apart from anything else so there are major and minor estrogens and they support the 11 systems of the body you know it's not just another hormone that does one thing it does multiple things and it's like the conductor of the hormone orchestra and so I think there's some basic biology um, that we could be learning that could be just going out there at much earlier levels um, at younger ages. Mm -hmm. And we would just take that information on as, oh, okay, right. Okay, so we've got estrogen, uh, progesterone and testosterone all coming from the ovaries. Um, they come from other places as well. But when we think about that dimmer switch that goes on and off, on and off each month, well, it kind of makes sense. Well, at part of the month, your joints and muscles are really supported beautifully and at other parts they're not. So if you're an athlete from a performance perspective, then that's going to have an impact on your personal best, how many, you know, how hard you can train or when you should be resting more. Mm -hmm. And if it is on performance day, you know, if it's on match day, like Dana Asher Smith found, that can have an impact. Um, and it can, and it applies to us non-athletes as well, which I would class myself as a non-athlete, you know. <laughs> and, you know, we can be incredibly creative and productive at certain times of the month, but other times that, you know, we may, we may not be. So it's about learning when your strengths and weaknesses are within your cycle and using them to, um, you know, to optimum effect. And I was doing some research the other day, and in Sweden, they're actually talking about this a lot more. The last couple of years, they've been doing lots oh, of work yeah. on menstrual health in the workplace. And one company um, kind of like went to the next level. And some of the projects that they work on, there was one in particular they talked about where some of the team members were females, menstruators, and they did everything around their cycle to make it work better. Wow. 
Yeah. So, you know, um, can be done, can be done. Well, it can be done. And you talked about the toolkit. And I think that's, that's something that I always talk about, you know, my own toolkit of, of mm. uh, rehabilitation tools that I use. But, um, you know, your toolkit's going to be different. It's a personalized kit. And similarly, uh, you know, for around menopause, maybe HRT is in that kit. And that's going to moderate this these fluctuating hormone levels and the uh, and the detrimental potential detrimental effects that 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 can mm. have. So, uh, your toolkit's personal to you. You you said that. So, getting to know you and what your yeah. challenges are around the cycle as it pr progresses yeah. normally, and then you know that. And it adds perspective and. Yeah. You know, um, that toolkit can be robust and flexible. You know, what you what you want today might not be what you want tomorrow and accepting that as well you know your your thoughts and your values and your beliefs change as, as you as you change mm -hmm. and as particularly with HRT you know mm -hmm. we have conversations with people oh, a lot about HRT and what they didn't want then they go oh actually I might now want it and those that did have it maybe don't like it you know mm -hmm. so it, there's no hard and fast rule and I think the sooner um, menstruators collect data on themselves track what's going on and really tune in and, and listen and then you also gain perspective and um, that was one of the things that really worked for me going through perimenopause which is why I'm so passionate about people learning about it beforehand I suddenly realized well no actually if you write it down you're not in pain every day but you're okay. perceiving that you are and you're not tired all the time it's just no. those moments of crushing fatigue and a lot and perspective really aided my mindset then and actually made me think right although I don't quite enjoy the exercise in the first instance I know when I've done it I feel better and that helps me with my joint pain and helps with this and everything and it was working with a personal trainer at the time because the year of my 50th birthday I decided um, I was tackling this perimenopause thing head on and so strength training was the, the word of the year and um I was took up aerial fitness and was learning how to do the silks how to do Cirque du Soleil you know me Philippa I just don't <laughs> to do things by half and there was, I realized there was this weight strength ratio in order to be able to do these things uh with a with a little bit of flair and so I was working with a private trainer and he, he would um so how are you today you all right Fee I go yeah yeah I'm all right oh right okay and Gradually, maybe I'll go, oh, yeah, I'm not too bad, or I'm okay, or this, or the other. And then one day I said, yeah, I'm good. And he went, oh, thank goodness for that. But he said something else, but, he, you know, we'll, we'll go with the short version. He said, he said, I said, why? I'm not, it's not that bad. I said, I feel good. He said, yeah. He said, but have you ever realized you have more ways of describing how crap you feel than how good you feel? And then when I looked at the diary and how I was annotating things as well, I realized that that was true. And that if I actually then looked at the information I was collecting on myself and went, you know, honestly, how do you feel today compared to yesterday? Um, what have you eaten? What, how have you moved? What have you done? Or what did you do three or four days ago that might have made today feel not quite so good? And where mm. are you on your cycle? Yeah. Um, and for me, that was a game changer just understanding and then much later I found out about the hormones and the functions and the roles um in a way that made sense in menstrual health so um that's one of the reasons why although we have the menopause school and they talk a lot about menopause it's the menstrual health and and I was speaking with one of our new graduates only yesterday and she said how much that module on menstrual health had finally joined the dots and helped to see the bigger picture and in actual fact helped her in her own family only just this week when her 12 year old daughter started her periods oh. she said i wouldn't have had that knowledge and understanding and we talked about it as a family so dad and brother and it was just it was just there no big deal there was no drama about it and this is what's happening and and she went it was amazing just knowing a little bit more about menstrual health in the big picture. So I'm on a mission. Well, I like that about you <laughs> because, you know, we're, I'm on a mission too. 
movement Good. movement as medicine is my mission yeah. and uh and i know i don't do a stretch without thinking about you <laughs> you know that <laughs> and you are always on my mind or in my calf muscle or in my <laughs> I was like, you know, what would Philippa say? What would Philippa you know. do? <laughs> and it is, it is interesting when you say that, uh, you know, you, you, you love it afterwards a lot more than you look, look forward to it. And I always look forward to it and love it afterwards. So, you know, kudos to you for sticking with the programme, Fiona. Uh, but we were talking about earlier the fact that young women, perhaps periods, get, get in the way of them exercising regularly. And we know that that is when the load, uh, the bone is laid down. You know, in adolescence, we're like we're laying down those bone, the bone matrix, and so we don't want these young women to be stopping doing exercise. Uh, and so we we need them to get that menstrual toolkit to help them yes. through, uh, so that they can remain active, continue to be active through the whole, and then pregnant. You know, oftentimes. It's after having children that women sort of fall off the wagon and, and exercise becomes a thing of the past, mm. uh, whether it's time pressures or is it the pelvic floor being a little bit less reliable than it was before? Could be. Although my daughter, I, I'm working really hard on getting my daughter to do her pelvic floor, my youngest one. So, yeah, um, so, yeah I don't know. I it's a tough one because I can see it happening to my daughters now, not, not, yeah. you know, doing exercise. Whereas I grew up doing the, the hockey. Uh, and then I probably didn't stop doing regular exercise until after I left college. I think it was actually going into work, into wow. a workplace, fitting that yeah. into a routine. Yeah. Um, you, and it's like trying to do a team sport now. There aren't many at 54, there aren't many teams that you can join. There's nothing. <laughs> I know it's not <laughs> miserable that isn't it walking football they've got I've seen walking football walking oh I can't remember what the other one I saw it the other day at the leisure center walking uh, football so that um well and then and you know maybe we should still be able to run around but by the same token if if there's something that isn't frightening for you to do you know because you're trying to work your way back into it without yeah you know, some tag kind. rugby's good though. I keep saying I'm going to start, start up uh, a group with tag rugby because my kids learn how to do that, and um, it's more like a game of chase, really, with a ball. Oh, um, yeah, true, true. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, but I do a lot of running around with Teddy now, my grandson. So we yeah. do, we play chase on the climbing frame, and um, I get all the other kids involved as well. So um, that's that's keeps me active but um and the kids did buy me a skateboard last year but I think after that Achilles injury I had I'm like no I don't think I've risked that one just yet oh I know it's kind of the thing is I just think I cannot afford to be injured I do not want to be injured I want I want to keep my sense of fun and explore new things but really still kind well, of doing a handstand is my target this year okay <laughs> <laughs> are you using the wall when you do it just just to be sure well oh, yeah I haven't even got past lifting my feet off the floor because of my my, my repetitive strain injury oh. so I'm working on that at the moment I'm up to three kilogram weights and so I'm, oh. I'm building up to it slowly I'm not going to be yeah. as ambitious as I was with the aerial silks no I think yeah uh, I, I had a go at that too mind you the hoop I was in not not the oh no I, I hurt my leg with the hoop oh, didn't like the hoop. Hard, the hoop I have to yeah that rigid but I did like I did like doing the silks. Yeah, I managed to get a few moves in and took some photos. Um, well, I suppose that's what I love about yoga and Pilates. They kind of look elegant, or they can anyway. <laughs> they don't. Not when I do it, I'm doing it wrong. Then <laughs> they can look elegant, and you can kind of channel. I, I said channel your inner ballerina. Uh, so that you can feel so tall and long and elegant. I, I, I do. I love that feeling. But, you know, it is different for everyone. I get that. We've all got our area of expertise, our, our area of uh, preference. And, you know, yeah. it, it's more, it actually works more if you enjoy 
what it is that you're doing. So believe it or not, it really is important to enjoy it. We've kind of gone off at a tangent a little we bit. Have. But we're talking about girls in sport in period, so it means something to us. And if you're listening, you could just rewind and figure out where we got here. But yeah, yeah, so it's got to be enjoyable. But um, And for girls uh, and even like older, you know, women, I know I was getting a lot of flooding and things like that at times. And um, there's more tools on the market now. There's things like menstrual cups and menstrual discs that you can use for, for that side of it. And, um, you know, looking at your nutrition before and after your cycle, uh, you know, your actual bleed can actually help with some of that. Um, yoga and certain yoga moves as well can help with, with relief of pain. And the other thing that I learned as well, um, I was going to a physio stroke uh, in Spain. She had another name after it. I can't remember what it was. But also, like, making sure that after you've had those period pains and after the bleed, that you mobilise that area and, and help stretch it out kind of thing, isn't it? Because otherwise we get those pains and then we're sitting in a position and we never really release that muscular strain and distress in that area during the other 21 days um and then the next time then you get around to it again and you're in pain again and so she helped me with some like you know making sure that I move my pelvis around and um kind of massage my stomach a little bit to help yeah. get everything drained away if you like and then prepare it almost like for the next one but it certainly yeah. helps and it helped yeah. really help with period pain yeah, I think uh, you get into patterns of holding. Mm. And so sometimes you forget to stop. Yeah. It's the thing. And so you're talking about release techniques. But actually, uh, I, I know that having been a runner regularly for the whole of my uh, adult life, I only sort of kind of retired a little bit, retired from running, although I did go again the other day when I was uh, 50. And... <laughs> And that was because of, you know, my back not really enjoying it anymore. Uh, but So anyway, but it really can help to sort of regulate the cycle and being physically active can mm. actually um, mean that you have less painful periods and the cycle and maybe less heavy bleeds. And I know for a fact that periods were never really a problem for me, certainly not I mean, I, I got a bit moody, but never anything around pain and never anything, apart from when I was younger, uh, around heavy, uh, you know, cloths or anything like that. So exercise, physical activity has those benefits if we, if we can tap into that. So similarly, at the other end, in, in perimenopause, uh, you know, mm. it's, uh, exercise can help us with temperature regulation, uh, the more that we are regular exercisers and used to getting overheated and uh, it's the dilation of the blood vessels, your body is just kind of a bit, you know what you're saying, mechanically it's more prepared for, yeah. those, for those fluctuations. And so uh, you've got as it, um, a, like a resilience or a metabolic flexibility, isn't it? If you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, your, your body is just kind of, more familiar with all, all of that, those things, temperature regulation, uh, circulatory uh, uh, adjustments, you know, and mm. all of that. So, uh, we, you know, I can't recommend this highly enough. I, the, it's an absolute fact that there is not one symptom of menopause that being physically active mm. will not help. It's so, definitely in that toolkit and it, it's a non-negotiable really. Moving, keep moving, little and often. If you can't, you know... I call it moving to start off with. If you if you don't can't face the word exercise, just call it moving, oh, yeah. or um, have a kitchen disco, pop pop the music on. We had Gypsy Kings on yesterday. <laughs> Teach you Teddy Bombaleo, Bombaleo. Oh, that is a good one. I I can I even know what song you're talking about. So that's pretty good singing there for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. we'll have to we have to have a kitchen disco another day because yes we should do that you know what thank you so much for joining me and having this chat about menstrual health uh we know i know that you have a fantastic online program available 
I do. Tell on us, the us. website talkingperiods.co.uk, it's called Menstrual Health Made Easy. And I'm going to pop a, a coupon code. So I've created it's called um, MH for menstrual health. So it's really easy to remember MH50, which will give you 50% off. Um, so you guys can use that probably up until the end of uh, the month. And um, yeah, go ahead and listen. It's a 12 part audio series. So, and it comes with some downloads as well that gives you kind of like the A to Z on menstrual health and uh, beyond the bleed. Beyond the bleed. Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Fiona. Thank you for asking me. Ooh. Always enjoy talking to you. Oh, thank you. And me too. On that note, I'm going to say cheerio. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye for now.